God, most gracious, most merciful. And may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet, our beloved messenger of God, Muhammad, and the purified members of his household and progeny. I congratulate you all, and myself, and the Islamic world, and the rest of the world, on this most blessed, auspicious, joyous occasion, on the birth of the light, of the divine mercy of God's messenger, as well as the birth of his grandson, our sixth Imam, the Imam whose name we all carry proudly, Imam Al Ja'f, as we call as we are all called Al Ja'fariya, Imam Ja'far bin Muhammad al Sadiq. May God's peace and blessings be upon them all. Brothers, sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the few minutes that I have, I wanted to spend just a few moments to make one point about the life of each one of these absolutely inspiring and great personalities in our lives, or at least they should be. A few moments to make one point about the life of the Holy Prophet, and a few moments to make one point about the life of our Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, peace upon him. We know in our religion that the notion of beauty is very important. In fact, in fact, we know that when we go to the Holy Quran, we see that the Holy Quran has recognized the importance of beauty. And the Quran takes great care in giving us very accurate descriptions of things that are beautiful. God's beautiful creations are described very meticulously, very artistically, very poetically, very eloquently in the Holy Quran. And when we go through these descriptions, one of those descriptions that comes back again and again about the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that of the sun and the moon. When the Quran describes the sun, it usually refers to it as a siraj. Have we not made the sun into a radiant light? And then when the Holy Quran talks about another type of beauty, that of the moon, also talking about its light, but also telling us that that beauty is different. The beauty of the light of the moon is different than the beauty of the light of the sun. So the Qur'an being meticulous and very precise uses a different word. When it refers to the moon, for instance, when it says in Surah Al-Furqan, Tabarak al-Ladhi ja'ala fi samai burujan, blessed be he who has made or placed into the heavens the constellations of stars. In astronomy they call them houses. And he has placed in it a lamp, Sirajan, again the sun, وقمرًا Munira, and a shining moon. These are very accurate descriptions given by the Holy Quran about the beautiful creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us multiple descriptions of his prophet throughout the Quran. One of them is the one that we find in Surah Al-Ahzab when he says Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira We have sent you, O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, as a bearer of good news and as a warner and as a summoner to Allah by his permission and and the Quran ends with these words وَسِرَاجًا Munira. And you are, O Prophet, Sirajan, the same description of the beauty of the light of the sun, 
and Munira the same description of the beauty of the light of the moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combined those when describing the kind of guidance that the Holy Prophet represents, the kind of light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made his most beloved of his prophets to be. So he combined in him the description of the guidance of the sun and of the guidance of the moon through their lights. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The point we're trying to make is not about this. This is just an introduction. There is no Muslim on earth, and in fact even non-Muslims who have considered the Holy Prophet to be the greatest human to have existed in human history. We all agree on the rank of the Holy Prophet, on his etiquette, on his character, on his personality, on his nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as witnessed by this verse of the Holy Quran. And the reason we mention it is, we all know there's a very famous saying from the Holy Prophet in which he says to Imam Ali alayhi salam, O Ali, there is no one who has known Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except you and I. And no one who has known you except Allah and I. And no one who has known me except Allah and you. So based on this, and now that we know what, how the Holy Quran describes the Holy Prophet, let's go to Imam Ali alayhi salam and see how he describes the Holy Prophet. And in the minutes that we have, we don't have time to spend too much time on this. So we just mentioned one little excerpt. This one I think is very important for our lives. I think most of us may have the impression that as a human being becomes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we pray more, as we fast more, as we read more Quran, as we gain more religious knowledge, we may think that suddenly our lives are going to be a lot easier, a lot more luxurious, a lot more comfortable. The reality However, is that as we gain this type of knowledge, as we gain this type of proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not that our life itself, the comforts of life and the luxury of life increases, not at all. In fact, we should start seeing life as something very detailed and secondary. What changes is our outlook on life. We become a lot more resilient and at peace in our heart and in our mind to see life for what it truly is. That's what really changes. And this doesn't necessarily mean that the hardships of life suddenly diminish. In fact, they may increase a lot more. It doesn't mean that we have less work to do. In fact, it means we have a lot more work to do. We need a lot more resilience and a lot more patience and a lot more hard work. And our life may be a lot less luxurious and a lot less comfortable. So given all of this, let's go to Imam Ali alayhi salam to see how he described the Holy Prophet. And which kind of life did he lead? So that if he is truly the example that we follow, then we have to keep that in mind, especially when we think about this concern or preoccupation or issue that we may sometimes have. The fact that if we get a little bit more religious, we think that suddenly our life has to become a lot more comfortable and easy and luxurious. Is that truly the case or not? In one of these instances where Imam Ali alayhi salam talks about the Holy Prophet, and I'm mentioning this one from the sermons of Nahj al balagha the peak of eloquence, from Sermon 160. And I'm read, not reading the entire sermon so as not to take too much time. I mention a few extra, uh, extracts from it. After Imam Ali alayhi salam praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gives all kinds of admonition and advice, he says, certainly in the Prophet of Allah was sufficient example for you 
and a proof concerning the vices of this world, its defects, the multitude of its disgraces and its evils, because its sides have been constringed for him. He's basically using the metaphor of a large camel. And he says when we look at the life of the Holy Prophet, we see that that camel wasn't very, very generous with the Holy Prophet, if life is that camel. Its sides were constringed for him, while its flanks, its sides, had been spread for others. He was deprived of its milk and turned away from its adornments. This is the beginning. And then he continues, You should follow your prophet, the pure, the chaste. May Allah bless him and his descendants. And him is the example for the follower and the consolation for the seeker of consolation. The most beloved person before Allah is he who follows his prophet and who treads his footsteps. He took the least, the least share from this world and did not take a full glance at it. This gives us an idea. The Imam is very accurate in his description. He basically says the Holy Prophet did not even look fully at the world. The world did not even deserve a full look from the Holy Prophet. Of all the people of the world, he was the least satiated and the most empty of stomach. The world was offered to him, but he refused to accept it. When he knew that Allah, the glorified, hated a thing, he too hated it. And that Allah held the thing low, he too held it low. That Allah held the thing small, he too held it small. And then he goes on to say, the Prophet used to eat on the ground and sat like a slave. He repaired his shoe with his hand, he patched his clothes with his hand. Later he says, consequently, he removed it from his mind, talking about the world. He let it go away from his heart and kept it hidden from his eyes. In the same way, he who hates a thing should hate to look at it or to hear about it. Certainly there was in the Prophet of Allah all that would apprise you of the evils of this world and its defects, namely that he remained hungry along with his chief companions and despite his great nearness, the allurements of the world remained remote to him. Now, and this is the main question, this is the highlight. The Imam is asking us, he's asking all those who listen. He says, one should see with one's intelligence whether Allah honored Muhammad as a result of this or did he disgrace him? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor the Prophet by not making the world luxurious and comfortable to him? Or did he disgrace him? If he says that Allah disgraced him, he certainly lies and perpetrates a great untruth. And if he says Allah honored him, he should know that Allah dishonored the others when he extended the benefits of the world for him, but held them away from him who was the nearest of all men to the Holy, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is not to go any further. This sermon is absolutely filled with gems. The Imam alayhi salam, in one little extract that I finally wanted to end with for this first point, he ends by saying, and this is Imam Ali alayhi salam talking, for us who know who Imam Ali alayhi salam is, and how he talks, and how precise and eloquent he is, these words are extremely significant. When the Imam himself says, how great is Allah's blessing, in that he blessed us with the Prophet, as a predecessor whom we follow, and a leader behind whom we tread. So the first point that we wanted to make has to do with this notion that if someone suddenly becomes more religious or more knowledgeable in religion, this does not necessarily mean that life is suddenly going to become luxurious and comfortable and easy. What it does mean is that you're going to have the spiritual, the psychological, and the mental fortitude and resilience and ability to deal with anything life can throw at you and remain at peace while you go through it all. And that's what the Holy Prophet showed in his entire life. That's the first point regarding the Holy Prophet. 
Now a couple of minutes about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Today, we all know the importance of science and specifically natural science in the world. Anyone who wants to be considered an intellectual and a thinker has to have some awareness of what's going on in the world of natural science. Today, if anyone wants to study the history of thought and scientific progress, you're going to have books and encyclopedias and documentaries starting from the ancient world, ancient China, ancient Egypt, ancient India, going through ancient Greece, the Roman Empire, and then there's a jump. And the jump is right into what they call the golden era of Islam. The golden era of Islam is what a lot of historians refer to when they talk about the time around the Khilafah of the time Harun al-Rashid, as they refer to him, and the time of Imam Musa al-Kazim alayhi salam, and during that time. What they do is that they look at the major figures in Islamic philosophy and arithmetic and mathematics and astronomy and physics and literature and so on and so forth and they see that there is almost a scientific revolution taking place at that time which lasts centuries if we wanted to really dig into the literature that we have and I'm really addressing myself to the brothers and sisters who have any interest in natural science, any ability to investigate these topics. When we go through the life of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, we find that it is filled with these gems about biology, about medicine, about disease and how it spreads, about astronomy, about geology, and these were taught to his students. The manner in which a light sees, uh, an eye sees the light. The manner in which chemical reactions take place. And these have been passed down. They became the initial elements through which entire disciplines were created afterwards. Except that if you study the history of science, there is never any mention of Imam al-Sadiq There is a jump as though these things happened on their own. And the reality is they did not. Nothing changed overnight in the Islamic world for suddenly all of these sciences to emerge. And if you dig deeper right now, and this is the point, if you dig deeper into this topic, there are mentions of Imam al-Sadiq. Today, according to my limited knowledge, there is a book that everybody refers to in Arabic and in English. The book initially was a French book that was apparently translated into Persian and then Arabic and recently into English. And the book is supposed to be about the way in which the Western thinkers and scholars and scientists view Imam al-Sadiq and his contributions to science. However, if you actually take the initial French book, which was actually a proceedings of a conference that took place in 1968 in the University of Strasbourg, that conference did not really have anything to do with Imam Sadat except for one article. But today the book that we have and it's circulating, if you compare it, the book is presented as though this is the manner in which the Western world and Western thinkers and scientists view Imam Sadiq and it's a big book. And it has many different editions in both Persian and Arabic. So the book for anyone who wants to be very academic in the way you approach it, the book is not reliable as a translation. Perhaps 80 to 90% of what's in the book is not what was in the initial book. So for that reason, people dismiss the book entirely, which is fine. The sad part in this, however, is not that that book is not an authentic translation. 
And by the way, the book does not have any references, does it have bibliographies, it's not well documented and cannot be considered a scientific book. It's supposed to present the contributions of the Imam. And there are many of his contributions in the book. But because there are no references, it cannot be considered an academic book. Okay. The issue, however, is that it is quite surprising for a world of people, an ocean of hundreds of millions of people around the world who all consider themselves followers and lovers of Imam al-Sadiq And we know as followers of the Imam what some of his contributions are. We don't know all of them. We're not scientists in all of these fields. But there are many who are scientists. And those who are not, they at least have the ability to dig into the literature and to take out the sayings and the statements of the Imam and present them to the world so that the scholars and the academics and the researchers can actually have access to them and then they will tell us what the Imam was saying and to what extent he was ahead of his time so that 50 or 100 or 200 years later when they say that chemistry came to be a discipline what the Imam was writing to his students or what he was teaching them was actually the beginning of that movement so today, there is no mention of the Imam. When in reality, if someone wants to be fair and accurate, we know that it was the Imam who was the trigger of that revolution because of the freedom he was allowed, the limited freedom, the relative freedom that he was allowed so that he can spread some of his teachings and show what Islam has in terms of these treasures of knowledge that can be used by the rest of humanity. So this is a call for myself and to anyone who has that ability that our, the state of our world should not be relying on one book that is not authentic to explain the contributions of Imam al-Sadiq to the rest of the world. That's one point. And related to that, this, is, this should not be seen as a compliment or as a supplement or as a bonus that we do. When some of the followers of the Imams would come to them and they would tell them, teach us how to get people to follow you. These are followers of the Imams. They want the people to know what the Imams have. They will be guided by them. The Imams simply told them, present the beautiful sayings that you have learned from us to the world and the people will follow us as a consequence. There's a huge duty on our shoulders to simply present the sayings of the Imams to the world. And there's a huge lack even in that respect right now. As we saw with the situation of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, not overall in this one field, his contributions to natural science, to medicine, to chemistry, to physics, to geology, to astronomy, when there is actual easy to find evidence for all of this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us follow the words of Imam Ali alayhi salam when he says that the happiest that anyone can be is to be one of the followers of his holy prophet and to be like Imam Ali, the Imam Ali alayhi salam himself who would say that I was the most loyal and devoted of the followers of the prophet to the point where I followed him like the newborn camel follows his mother every step. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us present an accurate, reliable, valid image of our Imams to the world so that we may do a part of that duty that is incumbent upon all of us. سيدنا على هذه المشاهدة